That gang is hexy. Um, I've only played a turn and a half in this. And, God, this... I can't remember any of the specifics of playing this thing many, many years ago. Um, I'm over 60, and I was a teenager, I think, when I had this. Let's see, this was 1985, so no, I would have been not a teenager. I would have been 62, see, 72, 82. I would have been, this game, I would have been 22, 23 when this game came out. So I would have been in Europe. And I want to remember where I got this game from. So not a teenager, my mid 20s, probably early 20s, mid 20s when I played this. And um, I want to say that at the time, you know, because I mean, pretty much at that time, it was just S for me. It was just SPI, and um, and um, Avalon Hill. So, and I always preferred SPI over Avalon Hill. And I think one of the things I can remember about this when I opened this thing up was, this is not a typical Avalon Hill map from what I remember. This map is freaking gorgeous, and this map is gorgeous. I don't don't authenticity who gives a crap this thing looks great man this map is gorgeous especially for the mid 80s and this is coming from a guy that is a mapping person who was prior my primary job in the army was a scout so map reading and land navigation was my thing and i'm a gis guy and been a gis guy for 18 19 years now so messing around with mapping and map data is what i do this thing from the 80s is gorgeous and i we've all seen a lot of games where they have the, the maps are just really good looking i always thought spi maps now maybe not like those first generation games that came in the white boxes where the maps were really plain but you know hey you had to start somewhere but i think spi's maps were always the better of the two you know grant this is an example though of an ah map for a game that's just flat out gorgeous i love this map this you didn't open this thing up and see a bunch of white green and blue and boom, that was it. I mean, come on. They made marshes. They made forests. The rivers look different. The mountains look different, okay? The seas. It's This thing is just, It's. It was, I thought it was just a well-put-together map. And to me, this map board said, play me. So, now I'm playing it. I can't remember where I pick. I think Murray sent me this in a, where he, bunch of, he bought a bunch of Avalon Hill stuff, and he sent this one to me. Um... God, long time. And, I, and I'm telling you what, this game must have a serious effect on a lot of people because all I've posted is a couple pictures on Facebook and there's all kinds of reactions and comments. And while there are a few out there that maybe this wasn't the best choice for them, a the majority of y'all seem to like it, and I did too. So. so you got two flavors for this game. You got the base game, which is, what, unfortunately, that's what I'm doing. And then you got the advanced game. And I wonder if I can drag the base game over more turns than the three turns it says. So I'm looking at the victory conditions, and it's just points on the last page of the base rules. All right. Oops, dropped it. One second. And there's your little chart there at the bottom. And I'm thinking, man, how are the Germans going to do that in three turns? All right. Well you got to count the cities they already own and the oil fields they already own at the start of the game, too, when you add this in. It's only a point for each of them. you got to get so many points. So, yeah, I think they can do it. But I've also read where some of you all commented on Facebook about, you know, for the Germ the Germans need to win this thing 41-42. So I've got June, July, and August of 41. Pretty much Barbarossa. And I need to get to capture all these points. So some of you all were saying the Germans really got to be aggressive. They got to just reach out there, uh, to, which means to me, much like the armor did anyhow, get themselves way out there ahead of everybody else, hope that supply catches up or airdrops catches up and take everything you possibly can. So on the second turn for the Germans in July, I have stretched a little bit. I'm still a little skittish about getting everything all the way out there because really the only things you can get out there that far, which is interesting because your infantry... And your armor had the same movement value. For the most, they're all sixes for the most part. Okay, you got a couple fives and fours in here, 
But I went ahead and stretched. We took the Germans have taken Smolensk for now. Okay. Um, the Soviets. Well, they're going to get some decent reinforcements here. Not much for July. They're going to get a few, and they're going to get almost double on the last turn. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Whereas the Germans, they're going to get a couple here in August. They only got three for July. So I've stretched. I pushed them way out there and stretched it. I have to see if I say I'm hoping I can just take the base game and apply the victory conditions for. Uh, beyond the three turns. Well, if not, we'll see. Either I'm going to play three turns, or I'm going to try to push it even farther to see how, see just how much damage the Germans can do, or how much uh, pushback when the Soviets start to overload with their reinforcement. Try to figure out some maybe working some of the uh, advanced rules into this thing, like the replacements and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so I reached out there and stretched quite a far for peace, we'll say. And the, I like the railroad rebuilding in this game. Um, extra point, just, you know, you're, there's no construction guys in there. You just, as your units move down, they pay an extra point along a rail line and you can extend it. And then it's five hexes, uh, no zone of control, no enemy units back to one of those rail lines. And then off the edge of the map, gray, the gray for the Germans and the red for the Soviets. Okay. And, um, that's where, you know, as far as the German after I'm not having to worry about it, but if you want to get those victory conditions in three turns, you got to push this on these armor units out and you can see where I've stretched here. So we've already gone up into Talon up yonder up there. All right. Haven't even messed with the fins yet. We are already beyond scoff is occupied, but we've already bypassed scoff. All right. Say we're in Smolensk right there. The old finger, the old blurry finger. We're in Smolensk. And uh, down south, sitting on the edge of Kiev there, okay. Um, Tarnopol's taken. Eh, that town there is going to fall, I'm sure. The Russians can't. They've actually put up a decent defense here along the Pruth, but uh, that's not going to last. Maybe push down here to Odessa and try to get that. I think I, think I figured out the Germans need nine more locations for victory. So, um, But what I wanted to do do while I had this up was and you know, just to maybe bring back some memories just two of the systems in the game I wanted to talk about one is response move which I think is decent because you can actually you're playing on a a, a large scale for distance and hexes I, I don't know specifically what it is but so that means you know you there's there's room for maneuver between units so they got this rule called response and how that works is, and it's really cool because it, it makes you think and start to set up your moves. So, for example, if this German unit were here, whoops, don't do that. If he were here, all right, and he moved down to here, and then he moved over to here into that zone of control, he could keep right on moving, right on out, okay? But... If he moved into the zone of control and tried to go to the next zone of control on that same unit's hex, this unit could respond into that hex and stop him and create a battle hex. However, you cannot respond into a major city or a fortified city hex. I think there's some other there's one other hex too you can't do that in. So you you can, you really have to work that to your advantage as you're moving uh, on the go. So maybe you. You, you move in, you have one unit move in and get into an engagement. And then, so like, for example, let's say this guy moves up here and he creates a battle hex right there. You get your marker, you drop your battle hex on there. You pull the units off the map, put them over on the battle chart. Now this guy here, all of a sudden, he's not going to respond because he's already in a hex. One, two, he goes right on around him with no problem. You've got to use that stuff to your advantage. Okay. So I think that's a that's an awesome rule because it allows you to maneuver, but it also allows the ability for the def defending force to keep you from bypassing too easy. All right, and then the combat system in this game, I think it's really really cool because you can stack whatever you want. Other than let's see, you can't have two air units in the same base hex, more than two air units in the same base hex. In a battle hex, you can have as many air units as you can fly into there. 
but and then it's like I said, once they leave and they uh, they go back to base, you can't have more than two at a base. So the combat is really cool. All right, I just showed you. You move into a hex, you create a battle hex with whatever units you get in there. All right, and then you'll go through all your 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 battle hex markers. All these you'll have these things on the map, and then you'll have the units that are in those hexes. You have them on the battle chart, which is over there, which I showed in a picture earlier. Okay. And then you'll fly air units in, and then the defender, he'll fly air units in, okay? And then during your combat phase, you'll do your battles. Now, how does that work? So let's say in battle hex number nine, all right, let's say that these two, oh, I don't want to do that. All right, we'll say that these two units were in battle hex number nine, okay? The, that panzer unit drove in there to that hex where this Russian panzer or armored unit was. He wrote it. So you pulled him off the map. You put your marker down. And now these guys are over in the battle box. All right. All right. So now we're going to go do combat. Well, before we did the battle, you have the air phase. So let's say we have some airplanes sitting at a base there within 10 hexes. And as the attacker, they went ahead and flew those air units in there. Then the defender gets a chance to fly planes in. Um, let's say he does. Let's say he's, these, he flies these guys down there within 10 hexes. They fly in there. All right. So now you get to combat. Now the, either side can have as many ground forces as you want in the hex. So we'll say this guy's in there and we'll say this guy's in there for the Germans. So they got an aircraft unit and they got two armor units. They got an infantry unit. They got this poor old Soviet, uh, tank unit. So we go to combat. Now here's how this works. You don't attack with all of those ground units. The attacker picks one to attack with. And then the defender picks one. All right. The defender will use his defense strength plus whatever train modifiers. The attacker will use his attack strength. Now, if he's got step losses underneath like this guy does here, like he's got one step loss, his attack strength would only be six. All right. If that attack strength marker one was underneath this Russian unit, his defense is two. He'd only be a one. All right. So then, so you would say, we'll say this is seven into two. All right. Then we're going to add the air. So the attacking air is four. So now he's 11. The defending air is two. So now he's four. So you would take the 11 minus the four is a plus seven. If you have terrain, then you're going to use terrain modifiers to change the die roll. So then you go to your combat table and you roll, you roll a D6. I love the old cardboard they did on these. And on that combat table, you would use that plus seven column. You would roll. And there's your results. Attacker step losses to defender step losses. If your number is in bold, you must retreat. Take the losses and then retreat. Simple. Simple system. And then, so if you knock them out, uh, most of them find a lot of right now the Soviets are getting eliminated. But they're putting step losses on the Germans. So you knock them out of there. Let's say that they took two step losses. He'd be eliminated. And the Germans, maybe they took a step loss. They would stay in there. And then at the end of the combat, complete combat phases, your air units would return to their bases, or they would do a, uh, oh, what do you call it, a trans, oh, a transfer segment where they could fly, where you have units that didn't participate in combat, they can fly up to 20 hexes to a new base, which is a city pretty much, okay? And that's how your combat system, and it's great, because it's really cool. I, I probably need to film it one time when I do it, where I have all my combats, battlefield markers laid out on the map. And all the units are over on the battle chart, which I took a picture of and showed everybody on Facebook. But that looks so cool. But there you got it, guys. This is Russian Front. This is the fun game to play. Like I say, uh, if I end it with the base game, I got I got another turn and a half to do. If I can continue with the with you know, like I say, take the carry the base game into the advanced stages, then I may try to do that too. Um, God, this, I I can't remember any specifics about this game back then in the eighties. But I just remember it was fun. And I remember the surprise, the look on my face when I opened that box or what I felt. It was really, really cool to see a game in the 80s and look that good. Um, yeah, Russian Front, Avalon Hill, 1985. Come on, get out there in those garages or in those basements. Dig that thing out. Get some memories going. Maybe set it up and play the quick one. And tell me what you all think. All right, I'm going to finish this thing off and try to get the last video up on this. Talk to you all soon. Russian Front, Avalon Hill. is Hexy. See ya.